In the name of the living God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. When I was young, words I sometimes hesitate to utter from this pulpit, perhaps between the ages of five and 13, I had a secret fear. I was terrified that one night, after all of us had gone to bed, there was a chance that someone would break into our house. I'm not sure if this is a common fear amongst children or whether it was just me, but whatever my parents said, they could never completely reassure me. I wasn't so frightened of the possibility that an intruder might steal my possessions, though I wasn't wild about giving those up. But I was very, very scared that they might do me or a member of my family harm. And then, when I turned 13, my great-great-aunt died, and I inherited from her a sword. <laughs> Not a toy sword. A real, standard army issue, Victorian sword. It had belonged to one of my forebears who served with the British Army in India, and it had been passed down to a member of the family to be entrusted with for their lifetime. I, for this generation, am the chosen one. No doubt I will, when the time comes, make sure that it is kept in safekeeping to one of my family's offspring. This sword is sharp and steely, and I kept it at the foot of my bed. And instead of feeling scared of someone breaking into and entering our house, I felt comforted that I would be able to protect my family. Because when you're 13 and you have a sword, there isn't much you think you can't do. Especially when the first Lord of the Rings film has just come out. What had once been used to protect my ancestral soldiers in India had been passed down to me and I now thought I could protect our home. Inheritance is where our gospel passage begins this morning. As Jesus is walking, a man runs up and kneels and implores of him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? There are two types of inheritance. The first is like the sword that my aunt bequeathed to me. It concerns the passing down of property, possession, condition or trait, from one generation to the next. It's the type that governments like to tax. It's like the moment when you see a child make exactly the same expression that you've seen on the face of their parents. The second type of inheritance concerns the reception of genetic traits or qualities directly to children. That's when people tell me I have my mother's nose or my father's hair or some seemingly act in total astonishment that my sons bear more than a passing resemblance to me. Both types of inheritance are forms of protection, designed to ensure the survival and flourishing of those who live on after us. The first is designed so that if you're wealthy, then you protect the interests of your family by passing on your collected wealth. The second ensures that over time, those qualities which make us attractive enough to procreate are passed on so that those same qualities are present in our family line. The first type we control, the second type we don't. But both, both are a form of protection. I wonder what forms of protection you've inherited. Things which previous generations of society have told you will keep you safe. Behaviours passed on to ensure your survival and your flourishing. I wonder if, like the protagonist in our gospel story this morning, you have protected yourself with wealth and possessions. For all of us, this is the most secure way of protecting ourselves from the vulnerability of facing personal medical, career, or social disaster. The trouble is, the more we possess, 
the more our possessions possess us. Focusing on managing our money, managing our property, ordering our lives around what we own, and defining our self-worth by what we have, we wrap ourselves in layer upon layer of material insulation. And so when Jesus calls to us, sell what you have, give up your protection, follow me, instead of springing to our feet, we try to avoid catching his eye. I wonder if maybe you've inherited the protection of status. If you go a few verses on from the end of this reading, you'll find James and John arguing about status. Both vying for the status of sitting at Jesus' right hand, both, like the rich man, trying to secure a future inheritance. The protection which status provides is to assure ourselves that we can be in a position where we are admired or feared or respected by others, but not in a position where we're reliant on others' love. That's why we find it so hard to let go of status, whether it's the status of having a job or holding a position of authority or even just having to admit fallibility in front of those who look up to us. It's hard to do because it requires us to renegotiate or to form relationships with people that depend on reciprocal love and not on power. And so, when Jesus calls us to become last and not first, we find it difficult to let go of the power and embrace the powerlessness of following where once we led. It's easy to think of these forms of protection as worldly things, not to be found anywhere near our faith or even in the spiritual order. But I wonder if you've inherited a form or two of religious protection. Maybe we've had a profound religious experience or two. Maybe we're so determined to focus on the significance of our own experience that it becomes our protection, the thing we can't part with when Jesus calls us. Maybe we're anxious that other Christians seem to be a little bit fuzzy on matters of scripture or ethics or whatever we've tried so hard and for so long to be certain about. Our certainty, our religious orthodoxy, these two can become ways of protecting ourselves from the reality of Jesus' call. Or here's one more. We might have formed a protection of social righteousness, where we've managed to boycott all the right things, avoid eating all the wrong things, corrected everyone when we, try, when we catch them using insensitive or inappropriate language, and of course, most importantly, explain to someone on Twitter why they shouldn't have said what they said. I've followed all these commandments since my youth, protests our central character. I've been fastidious in keeping them. Haven't I done enough? So when Jesus looks at him and loves him and calls him to live by grace and not just by adherence to the law, he goes away grieving for the loss that protection has given him in his own social group. If we remotely recognize ourselves in any of these descriptions or if we've inherited something else which protects us from having a real relationship with God, the gospel is saying one direct, simple thing to us this morning. It's time to let go of those protections. Holding on to them amidst the uncertainty of life and the fear of death is understandable. Keeping them as the source of our identity and security is a very common thing to do. But if we want to meet Jesus face to face, if we long to leap in delight and joy because we've put our trust in no one and nothing but him, it's time to let go of those protections. The rich young man wouldn't part with his money. That was his protection. James and John didn't want to part with their longing for status. That was theirs. 
we don't want to give up on our religious orthodoxy or on our social righteousness. But God is gently, firmly saying to us, it's time to let go of those inherited protections and time to inherit something far more fragile. You see, God lets go of his protection when he comes among us in a manger at Bethlehem and hangs before us on a cross outside Jerusalem. He empties himself to become one of us. He humbles himself to save us. He becomes vulnerable because he so desperately wanted to stand before us and he calls us to become vulnerable so that we can stand with him. And if you find the idea of giving up the protection of wealth, of social status, of religious orthodoxy or social righteousness difficult, here is the really terrifying thing. God is not offering us an alternative form of protection. There's nothing to buy here, no status and no way of living that will make life's difficulties go away. Jesus isn't an upgrade to our armor a path to a higher social standing, or a better rate of interest on our savings. Life with Christ does not give us security and safety, but it does give us something more. It gives us the opportunity to experience life in all its fullness. It gives us eternal life in the presence and praise of a God who wants nothing more and nothing less to be with us. It frees us from the tyranny of having to protect ourselves all the time with power and possession and releases us to become who God calls us to become. It calls us into the love which casts out our anxiety in life and our fear in death. When Jesus turns to the disciples to explain what he's been saying to the rich man, he addresses them as children. He calls them children because he wants them to inherit a different way of life, to pass on those traits and characteristics of his heavenly father, to join in Jesus' family lineage. That's what baptism is. That's our inheritance. An inheritance not of perishable or transient things like wealth or status, but an inheritance of permanent, enduring, and unending value, of love, of joy, of peace, forgiveness of sins, and life eternal. A life which doesn't fear the consequences of not being protected, but which embraces the opportunity to live in Christ and let Christ live in us. It's time to let go of those protections. It's time to live. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.